She was introduced to many of us on season four of RuPaul's Drag Race. She brought her nuts back in our face during All Stars 1 and All Stars 4. And she's the host of a new podcast right now with Manila named The Chop. Her name's Latrice Royale and she's about to be exposed. Oh, you ready? Hey, baby, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Just, just just living a little bit, living a little bit. Well, this episode of Exposed is sponsored by Surfshark. Now, Surfshark is an award-winning VPN or virtual private network. And with the Surfshark app and browser add-on, you can access the internet from whatever country your heart desires. Now, this basically lets you access and unblock websites and content that you may not usually be able to see. Kind of like checking out other countries' drag race episodes. So, you know what I mean. Let's say you want to watch the latest episode of Canada's Drag Race, but you can't do it because of the country that you're in. Just use Surfshark to change your virtual location to watch those episodes that are blocked in your country. So make sure to head on over to surfshark.deal slash joseph and enter promo code joseph for 85% off and three extra months for free will only be available for the next 20 days as of today, August 27th. Well, thank you so much, Surfshark, for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. I want to get into a little bit about your early life. Now, you were born and raised in California. Is that right? Correct. I was born in Torrance and raised in Compton till I was uh, in middle school. Then we moved out to the valley, to Pacoima, because my mother didn't want me to do uh, Compton. You know, she wanted a better life. And so I was in... uh, San Fernando Valley until midway through high school. And then we I moved to Riverside, to Moreno Valley, and finished out there. And so I've been um, quite uh, exposed to the white children so I could be better than the ghetto. So here we are. <laughs> well, well, speaking of children, what were you actually like as a child? Um, I was always, my mother always called me her special child. I always um, was a warm spirited, very sensitive kid, you know, just full of life and hope and vigor um, as kids are. And, um, you know, as I got, you know, I come from a broken home, so it was really difficult because I knew I was different, you know coming up than my brothers. And the only thing you could do is either be in a gang, go to military, and then there was me, who I wanted to play with Barbie <laughs> and and jump double dutch and play hopscotch with the girls, you know. So. <laughs> when was the first time you remember, like, liking a guy? You remember, uh, well, I'm asking you, do you remember? I'm going to ask you how old you are first. I'm 29. Fuck all the way off. Um, you won't remember. But back in the day, they used to have the Sears catalog, the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Maybe your parents had it around. Um, uh, but back in there, they used to have the little un- the underwear ads for, for men. And that's when I was just like, well, what's in there? <laughs> what's in that bulge there? You know, I was very curious. And that's when my first, you know, uh, memory of identifying as... I like boys. Yeah. I like, yeah, I knew that from young on, very young, I knew. I used to do that in Target, go into the underwear aisle and just stare at it. Didn't want any underwear, just wanted to look at it. Nope. Nope. Yeah, those briefs, those briefs, those were the, no, that was the next best thing, you know? Half naked men on the cover with just the underwear on, honey, that's my kind of perusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you eventually end up donning drag. You start dressing up. And I heard that your first time that you started dressing up was for your friends as Wanda and Living Color. Now, how did that come to be? And how did that segue into your drag persona? Um, First of all, I love the fact that you do your research and you get your facts together, hunty. So props to you for that. Um, I live. Um, But yeah, I actually uh, did drag as Wanda Halloween. Um, My color guard friends, you know, we just like to encourage each other to be as stupid as possible so we can laugh at you. Um, And so uh, I was in on the joke. I was there for it. So I did Wanda, honey. Gonna rock your world. Hey, I'm ready to go. Um, for those of you who don't know who Wanda is, look up Jamie Foxx in Living Color. Uh, <laughs> um, and I thought that was gonna be the end of it. 
But they were convinced that I should do the amateur show at the Copa, this world famous Copa down here in South Florida. May she rest in peace. Um, but uh, I was like, there's no way you're going to get me on the stage. I'm not getting up in no dress. I, you know, I don't know how to do makeup. I don't have no hair. No. They're like, we'll get you together. And honey, they got me together. All right, baby. We went to that guard closet because we didn't have size 16 shoes just readily available like Amazon Prime. I didn't have no hair, bitch. We got some fabric wrapped it in a turban around my head. It had some gold lame wrapped it around my ass. I didn't have no shoes. I went out there and did this like interpretive dance, honey, and they looked at me like, what in the actual hell are you doing? And I got drink tickets and a fashion citation and sent home. <laughs> But then I came back the next week and my roommate had got me some hair and shoes and I made my own dress um, and I won the contest. And then that was the baby. That was all you needed to give me a little bit of like, okay, you can do this. And I ran with it. And here I is almost 30 years later. Mm -hmm. And what about the name Latrice and then Royale? Because you also have a drag mother whose last name isn't Royale, right? Oh, correct, correct. Um, well, like, when I was coming up, I actually, like, when I first started doing drag, I didn't have a drag mom. I really didn't. I um, My drag mother came out um, later in my career. Um, but Latrice was my friend from, high, uh, from, from grade school, from elementary school. Beautiful little black girl, wavy, long, wavy hair, and she was my little ace boom. We just all were little run lunch buddies together. And so I always uh, associated the, her name with pr being pretty. And so um, that's why I chose that name. And then I was signing up for the contest, and I didn't have a last name. And they're like, well, you're Latrice what? And I was like, mm -hmm. and my friend Matt was with me and he was like, well, you're chocolatey and fudge like Royale. You should be Latrice Royale. And I was like, Latrice Royale. And it just kind of rolled off the tongue the right way. And I've been that ever since, like day one. When it's right, it's right. You know what I'm saying? And, and it just <laughs> happens. But it, I think that that's interesting you say that because a lot of the queens that I've talked to, a lot of times their names are just whims. Like it just comes. And when it sounds right, it sounds right. That's right, that's right. Mm -mm. So the year is 2011. You audition for a little show called RuPaul's Drag Race. It's season mm -hmm. four. And this was a dare. Oh, yeah, that was too. Because I was talking shit. That's what happens when you talk. Like, we were watching just like everybody else. I watched all the seasons, honey. We were on season three. And I was watching with my friends. And Stacy had came on there crying because she her cake wasn't good and she was fat and didn't know it. I, like whatever the case may be, uh, but I was just reading her for filth, you know. And they're like, "Well, you talking all this shit? Why don't you go ahead and email them then? Go go see." And I went into my room and I went to just go email, and they were actually auditioning, and I didn't even know they were auditioning. And I was like. And I just wrote them an email. I said, I'm larger than charge, and I'm tired of these fat girls getting on here and acting like they fat and crying about it. I can show you better than I can tell you. And here's my phone number and my email, and here's some pictures. And then two days later, I got a phone call. Damn. Just like, like that. What, what did that feel like? <laughs> it was crazy. They were like, you need to get your... Um, your audition video in. I was like, audition video? They're like, yeah, we just need you to go onto the website and then uh, make a video because we need it in by Monday because I want to push you for uh, this next meeting because they're going to have another chop or whatever. And I was like, girl, I am working all week and I weekend I am booked. I don't got time to be editing and doing all that. Like, don't worry about making it pretty. Just get it in, answer the questions. So I literally sat in my room with my webcam on my computer, painted my face and answered the questions as I was getting in makeup and did a runway, showed them my closet. And that was my tape. It was so raw and so like homemade. And I got on the show. <laughs> Have you have you seen that tape since? Have you like rewatched it? I, I, I would love to see it. Like I'm like, where is it? If it's circulating somewhere, somebody no, uh, over there at World of Wonder. Please, I would love to see that tape. T um, 
RuPaul always laughs at me and makes fun of me. She's like, because there was part of it, I had to retape it twice because I lost all of the first part, so I had to redo it, and the lighting wasn't so very good looking. So all you can see is my teeth <laughs> in the video. So RuPaul was like, I remember your tape specifically because all we were looking at is teeth and eyes. And I was just like... <laughs> It wasn't the day of the ring light and the back light and all that, honey. It was just, you know, very simple. simple. It was simple and raw. Wow. And so so you get on season four of Drag Race. You're having this time. I talked to one of your friends, Willem. He was the first interview that I did for this series. Now That's a baby. Yeah, and he, he told me some things and, you know, like the whole thing about... He was talking about food money that they gave you and it was very low and the production quality and everything back at season four was not up to par of what what it is now. And he had mentioned that there was somebody who was working there who didn't know your name. They didn't know our names. They called Latrice La something, this white devil bitch. So I was like, bitch, they're racist. And once I told Latrice and got Chad going, we stood up for ourselves. Is that a true story? These are all true stories. Like, this is all like the gospel like that day in particular our was the day that like we've had several moments where like we popped off on production and producers because it got to the point where we felt like we were being disrespected like are you kidding me you gave us thirty dollars for nine grown men girl nine grown ass men oh, no ma'am so that was part of it and then the I don't know who this woman was that came in. She came in like midway through and like she was going to be the new sheriff in town. I don't know what she was feeling, but she didn't know any of our names. And like they had these um, lanyards with all of our pictures (laughs) on the lanyard in and out of drag so that they would know who the frick we were. She never even took the time to look at her lanyard. She has it around her neck and didn't know my fucking name. Then she didn't know another girl's name. And when I tell you Chad Michaels snapped, Mother Dust went left on this hoe. Let her have it, honey. She was like, no, you, you, what's her name? What, she went down our line to every girl. What's her name? What's her name? What's her name? You don't even know. That's disrespectful. Don't get out of here. Like she went left on this woman. I, I was, was like, like mm, mm-hmm. you better <laughs> learn it, Linda. Learn it today. <laughs> wow. But but Funny. It's, it's, Ooh. Yeah. That's just it crazy that you said that because everything that you said like matches straight with Willem's story. And so like a lot of times. I did you. Yeah, and a lot of times people like, you know. Willem will speak a story and then people will be like, no, no, that's a lie. That's a lie. It's Willem. It's Willem. And it's like, mm. So there you go. Receipts, receipts. <laughs> it's too good to lie about. I mean, the truth is more juicy than trying to like amp it up. It is what it is. I wish that were. Yeah. And I mean, you had a lot of highlights during your time on season four. You know, you had the get those nuts away from my face which was iconic, and then you had mm-hmm. your iconic lip sync of You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, which I oh. think was the first time I saw on Drag Race an actual lip sync performance where there was so much power and not like crazy stunts. Like literally, you embodied the song. How did that feel when you actually had to do that and then the response afterwards? Oh my goodness. I just remember that being one of the most terrifying moments because you're already feeling, okay, you're in the bottom and this is the moment you have to like prove yourself. It's a ballad. It's what I do. It's my song. Like I do Aretha, like it's in my wheelhouse. And I was like, if I get eliminated doing what I do, that's going to be just the ultimate devastation for me. You know what I mean? It was going to be the hugest blow. And I had already made made up my mind that I was not going to move. I, I knew right away. As soon as I knew I was lifting, I was like, I'm not moving. I'm pregnant. And if we're going to do this, let's do this. 
And so I just started singing to my baby and it was all in the moment and it just happened and I got done and I felt, I don't know how you can feel like a, like a mom and I'm a man. Like, you know what I mean? I felt like I had just really had a moment. And <laughs> it's so weird. But the response once it aired was like from so many women who were like, Oh my God, thank you so much. You encaptured exactly how I felt when I was pregnant. And Bob, I never knew and never knew it could be expressed this way. And I, I, it was overwhelming, but it was uh, a wonderful moment in, 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 in Jack Hurstry. Now, another moment that you ended up having, and I think it was one of the first moments ever on Drag Race where somebody actually opened up a lot about their life and you open up about you know, going to jail and the moments after that and how that shaped you. Did you do that all on your own? Did you feel so comfortable enough to do that? Or was it kind of like the producers were like, hey, we need a story, like this is where we want things to go? Oh no, absolutely not. It was all on my own because what happened was I didn't know if I was gonna make it on the show. I was really scared that I wasn't gonna be cast because I had a record and I was a felon. And like everything that I had done up until then was a no because I had a felony. And so um, when they said yes, and I was like, this is my redemption at life story and I wanna share it, they were all about it. And so um, I, I, there were no qualms. And like when, when Rue asked me that question, I was just like, oh, you really wanna know? Because we can go there. And he's like, I really wanna know. I was like, and then I, I saw the rest. You saw how it happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that also made you relatable. You know, like, I think that that is a big thing, like being able to relate to a queen and being like, you know, oh, they're a regular person. You know, at the end of the day, I think that is a humongous thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're getting towards the end of season four. You're in a joint challenge with somebody named Willem. And you guys are called up to the front. You win the challenge. <laughs> and then all of this stuff happens. And Willem is called back up. What did you think was actually happening in that moment? I had no idea. We were all like, what's going on? What's, what's happening? What's, what the fuck's going on? What is, what, why is she going, why is she calling Willem up? And we literally like, Obviously, you saw Untuck was unhinged. Like, that was wow, Untuck. It had just become, everything had come to the surface and was boiling over. And we knew that some shit was going down because production was just acting weird. Everything was weird that day. You know what I mean? Like, you can just feel it was a little off kilter. And I never expected that, though. I just... She was sick and puking next to my feet. And I was just like, girl, you all right? Like, and then they were like, some things have come to my attention and you have violated the rules and you have been banished, bitch. Banish it. Get your shit and get out. You are banished from the kingdom, honey. I was <laughs> we were gagged. But my biggest question still to this day, is I wanted to know who would have went home out of Sharon and Pee, Pee Because they were in the bottom. And they had lip synced. That would be a different season four ending. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? That would have changed the whole course the of whole her stream. game. Damn. So, so <laughs> you just you just like gave me this thing in my head and I'm like, now the finale's all different and everything's different. <laughs> Speaking of that finale, you end up being crowned Miss Congeniality of season four. And this year's Miss Congeniality is Latrice Royale. Yeah. Now, this was back in the day where the fans voted online. Yes. And this wasn't the day oh, of the, oh, the spamming, the spamming of everything that one year. <laughs> so how did that feel to know that you had t 
touch so many people at home and that they, I, I don't mean physically touching, but you know, like other touching, somebody like you touched a lot of people's hearts. Like how did that feel? It was so overwhelming and it took me a long time to even grasp hold. I really like, I was in the, I was there, but I was not in the moment. Like I was so overwhelmed, like majority of the time, like especially that first year, um, it would be a, like I would walk into a room and the entire room would stand up and I would just be like, I'm just trying to get some food at the buffet. But, you know, <laughs> we were on cruises and shit and people would just be standing up everywhere I walked in. It was crazy. <laughs> it was really crazy. But um, it felt good because um, I was able to share my story, be authentic and not waver from my my true self and it was embraced and accepted and that's that means the world to me so that's why yeah i hold that real real close to my heart and then a year later in 2012 you end up on a forgotten television show called all stars one um the show yeah. of it, i just I just rewatched this actually like last week and I never realized how insane these challenges were that you guys had to do that made no sense with your drag at all. Like there was like a basketball mm -hmm. challenge and then there was like the you guys on the street and like you had to dig through the garbage and all this stuff was happening. Was it as crazy and hectic behind the scenes as what we saw on the TV? Absolutely. Because I felt like because I know they were, they were making that shit up as they were going along. Like they were making this shit up in the back room, trying to figure it out. What are we going to do next kind of moment? And they got us there. They got 12 of us there. They're trying to get us to all some airtime, which I can appreciate, but y'all didn't think this all the way through. <laughs> y'all did not think this all the way through clearly because these challenges are ridiculous and these pairings are ridiculous. And so, um, it, it, it was very stressful. And although it aired a year later, I filmed it right after my season. That part. Well, after that experience, um, you ended up in 2014, you ended up performing with somebody named Jennifer Hudson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, now let me ask you, that was probably one of the first times that I remember seeing a drag queen and a celebrity figure, either a musician or actor or something, actually doing something with a queen. Um, that has since evolved to recent days of a lot of different artists and a lot of different people using drag queens in every shape, form, or way. Do you yeah. feel like there's a difference between um, actually caring about queens and then using them for stunts? Oh, uh, absolutely. That's why I don't participate in those. I'm not going to be your stunt queen so you can feel good and like you're part of and you're an ally and you're part of what we're doing um, because it's just show and propaganda. And my point of that especially is because like these big shows take time to plan out and the queen is always the afterthought and they're the last minute addition to. And so then you got to rush around and cancel stuff and come to some rehearsal for whatever, whatever, whatever. No, Mary. No, Mary, my career is just as important as your career. So let's get that straight, first of all. And I'm not a stunt queen, and so I will not, I will gladly not participate in those kind of situations. For real. That's good that you've realized that, though. And that's yeah. good that you, you hold yourself to that level. Yeah. It's just like, you know, I... I I respect the ones who really care about drag and J Hud, baby. She, she, her, she was raised by drag queens. They, baby, she, she is for us, by us, with us. You know what I mean? And so that's why I, you know, like, it happened so fast. That whole fashion rocks thing, it literally happened in twenty, like, not even twenty four hours, twelve hours. And within twelve hours' time, I was on a plane to New York for rehearsal for a live show on Tuesday. I left out Monday afternoon for rehearsal that night for a live show the following night. Now this is when I was like, woo, this is show business, baby. This is how your jet set. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
<laughs> Speedy, quick, to the punch, and not $30 for nine people. Uh, not $30. <laughs> so I heard a little rumor through the rumor mill, too, that you were asked to be on All Stars 3, and you declined that. That is correct. What made you decline it then and then decide to do it for four? Oh, God. Um, okay. So what really made me decline it then, like, it was like, it was a conflict of interest, actually, because I had clients that were on All Stars 3 um, that I represented in my management firm. So, like, it would make sense for me to go and compete against it just didn't make sense. So I was like, no. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, y'all go ahead and do that. And and they did. And I declined. Um, they asked me again, my first, when they asked me for four and I was just like, no, my first initial answer was no. But then I had to like, think it over, get some spiritual advice, you know, and, and figure out what my next move was. And so I decided to do it knowing what my path was going to be. So um, let me ask you, when you go into something like an All-Stars 4, did you know already the other queens that were going to be in there? Do you guys kind of know because it's talk of the town? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I mean, let's be real. Like, we know. Uh, Season 1... They got me. I didn't know, like, who was going to all be up in there. And so, like, I knew some. But, like, when Mimi showed up, she definitely, that was a gag for me. I did not expect her. Um, but we this last, yeah, season four, baby, we we all was like, girl, see you there. All right, girl. You need anything? You got this? You good? <laughs> That's how it is, honey. You know. We know. So you get on there, you end up in handcuffs with Manila, you don't get your grand entrance as you should have had. Do you feel like you being one of the first girls to come back on the show after All Stars 1, like that was actually on All Stars 1 and then doing another All Stars, do you feel like that put a target on you in any way? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yes. Um, We've already been there twice before and these new girls are fresh um, either off their season a year or two at most, um, and they are hungry and have a lot to prove. So, yeah, there's definitely a target. Like, this bitch had her shot twice. So, unless she's amazing <laughs> and we can't touch her, then she gotta go. And here we are. <laughs> 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 you you mentioned on your Hey Queen interview that you were kind of hurt by WoW and how you're portrayed in yeah. All Stars 4. But yeah. since then, you've been on Family Feud with Rue, and it seems like you're more involved in, you know, the Drag Race universe. So how did you end up, like, reconcil- reconciling, like, how you felt on the inside and the internal things to actually, like, go forth and be like, you know what, I'm going to be with Rue and Steve Harvey and Family Feud? <laughs> um, well, because I'm bigger than all the bullshit. And I'm just really being honest. I'm bigger than the bullshit, and I know where it came from. I know what TV is. I know what game they played and tried to do and failed. It was, you know, um, it it was a learning experience for me because, um, especially when it comes to trust and feeling like, you know, certain people have your back. When... You know, you don't you you find out that not everyone plays by the same rules. Um, but it was really um, eye opening, and it was a painful lesson in um, the hate that the girls were getting um, prior to me. And um, I don't like that feeling. I never liked that feeling. And I was just really disappointed because all I did was do what they asked me to do. I did what they asked me to do. And if you had seen the full versions of the critiques, you would understand kind of, even if I sound entitled or cocky, the reason why. 
because the entire judges panel was giving me nothing but props and praise and lifting me up and telling me how much I've evolved and this and that and fans of me and all the, you know, and so it wasn't that I was ever trying to boast and be feel like I was better than the other girls. No, I've just lived and I've experienced and I've done. And so that makes me qualified. That's all. Like I don't play games in life. I, I, I live and I take my job very seriously. So um, that's it. I'm not good at drag race, but I'm good at life. <laughs> <laughs> that's a quote that you need to have like hung over. I promise you I'm going to get a t-shirt. I'm not good at drag race. I'm good at life. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, you mentioned the negativity and stuff that you got from fans and, and how people around the fandom, like, you know, they started, once they went on VH1, it became more of a mainstream thing. People were more yeah. entitled to give their opinions on the internet. Oh, the internet's more yeah. popular now. So you end up getting eliminated from All Stars 4. You come back in the Lala. Perusa episode mm -hmm. yep. and you end up winning the next challenge and you end up sending Valentina home mm -hmm. the following <laughs> week you and Manila are up against each other and Naomi Small sends home Manila one thing that fans were not happy with and that they attacked you for was that Manila was so emotional when you had to leave the first time why were you not emotional for Manila see what they didn't show is that we had already did all that so that that was done. And that's the part of the, the 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 perception of the editing that happened that made it seem that way. And then when Manila cracked a joke, I was laughing at Manila's joke that she made when she was exiting. So me laughing was laughing with my friend because now we're sharing in on a joke together. So it was like what do you want me to do? Throw myself on the floor? I don't know. I didn't know Manila like had a meltdown. The the whole thing of it was like that lip sync that Manila was doing to save me um, had so much weight on it from our previous season. And so she put a lot of weight on herself. I have let that shit go. I don't blame her for us going home. Never, ever have I blamed her. And, um, for fans to come up with their own like scenario of what should have happened and I was laughing or I didn't get emotional. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I went through. And so that's the part where people need to take a step back, have a seat and know that there's another side of the story <laughs> that you didn't see because they didn't want you to see that. They wanted to build it the way they built it. And so just the same way you didn't see, like I sounded crazy because I responded to uh, an interview based on a memory from a year ago <laughs> and hadn't seen the episode. So I don't know what they showed. So when I responded, I responded based on my experience that I had and it wasn't lining up with what they showed. So I sounded like a lunatic. I'm like, yeah, when we are at the mirror and da 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 there was no part that showed me and Monique at the mirror while she was getting ready and I was talking to her and she wasn't looking at me and I felt like she was disingenuous. That was where that came from. And so like, they never even showed that. And so I just sounded like I was crazy and delusional. And it just like, and it just goes to show you, editing is wonderful. <laughs> it can help Brilliant. you or it can hurt you. It can help or hurt you. And I, and I, I, I knew that. And I was like, don't blame it on the editing, but this little team of people who was in the editing room did not do their homework. Like, they did not. They didn't know what to do with me. So I got the tea after the fact and um, from some very important people um, that work on the show who gave me the real tea and um, apologized and was like, I don't know what the hell they were doing and they didn't know what to do with you and they thought they were going this way and they went left and blah, blah, blah. So I got the full scoop. And, you know, as far as me being able to, you know, continue my work with them because I wasn't bitter at them. I knew who exactly I was mad at. I knew who was behind me looking the way I looked. And so it wasn't 
at World of Wonder as a whole. It was a sorry ass production people that they had, those sorry ass story people. So they're not there anymore anymore. So it's all good. How did you handle the negativity that you received from the edit? I um, tuned out. I just completely, um, I, I responded with, like, if I did respond, it was always with love and the complete opposite of what they were looking for. Um, when they tell me, um, you've ruined your career because you sent Valentina home, you're never going to work again. Oh, you're so horrible while you wear all these same dresses. You don't know what I went through, why, what happened when I was there. You know, I didn't have the same opportunity of getting ready like these other queens because I was working, baby. I wasn't sitting at the house. I was out of the country when they called me to come do this show. So um, that's first of all. And um, the other part is just like... Um, I'm going to give you love and kindness and say, I'll try better next time. And I'm sorry that I didn't do the job that you felt I should do for you. And, um, you know, I'll try harder. I'll get better. And that's it. <laughs> I don't got time to be mad at people that I don't know. Who got time to have you? Like, I don't have the energy to stay mad and, like, and I'm not going to beat myself up and start believing what these people are saying because I know what they're saying has no weight because what you didn't give me, you cannot take away from me. Don't make me go to church on you, okay? You didn't give me joy, you can't take away my joy. You didn't give me this career, I built this career. So you can't take anything away from me, darling. You can't cancel this because uh, I own it. And I'm running this shit. So. That's deep, Latrice. I'm, I'm just, just, you, you know, know. It's just like people think that you can't give people power over you. And I really want to impress all my sisters. I know because when we get into this, this um, platform and we're on the scope of having to live up to this expectation of what you think their drag, what, what they think your drag should be. That's not how it's supposed to be, boo-boo. I don't do this strictly for you. This gives me and brings me joy. And you can either get on the bandwagon or get off. But this is what I'm giving. And I'm only going to elevate myself to my standards and the level that I want to be. I'm not doing this for you. Mm -mm, boo boo I love you and I'm glad you are getting your life but boo boo I got a house and a mortgage to pay for there you go Ooh, I feel like I was just in like Sunday church right there it's like the sermon <laughs> of the me, day you get me riled up <laughs> you <know I> mean. <laughs> now one rumor that has gone around the reddit world is that the double crowning was meant for you and Manila. Do you believe or feed into that rumor? I do. I want to believe it with all my heart. I do. I want to believe it with all my heart because I never seen such cracked faces when they sent us home. I got to see it both times, like cracked face, like, oh shit, what are we going to do now? Because baby, let me tell you something. When I got eliminated that first time, <laughs> I threw them in for a loop, honey. I was like, okay, y'all got my ticket ready because I am ready to go. All right, I'll see y'all later. Y'all got me ready to go. Can I get my um clothes from the uh for the uh what we were, for the confessional? I need my little daytime look. Can I get my phone back? They were like, no, um, so and so's gonna come and talk to you. Just, just, just hold tight. Just hold tight. There's something happening. Just wait, hold tight. You're not going to be able to just, just yet. Just hold tight. So I just rolled my eyes. I'm like, girl, here we go. So um, when they came to talk to me, they're like, all right, so here's the situation. We're going to bring you all back. And so that episode is happening tomorrow. Or not the day after tomorrow. So I literally had one day off. <laughs> so I went to the mall, went to a movie, ate some crab legs, 
and the next day I was back in in back in production. <laughs> it's like all oh, this one day off, oh, girl. Y'all doing the most, honey. Y'all doing the most. And then I knew that I had to like. I was gonna fuck him up. I was like, what if I don't pick Monique? <laughs> For the lipstick. See, I was I was thinking all these things like I can really mess up production and not give them what they want and I pick Na- pick Naomi or, or 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 anybody else other than Monique and it would have been a different show. It would have been a different show. I could have picked Trinity. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But I play the game, and I did what they wanted. I knew what they wanted to happen, and so we did it. We made TV. You made TV. <laughs> you made TV for three different seasons. Do you have any regrets for any of those seasons? I just told you all of them. <laughs> uh, no, I... I I mean, I had a really, really, really fun time filming All Stars 4. Don't get me wrong. It was the after shit that made it not fun. Like, the production part of it, we had a blast. We had a blast. But my only regret is that um, they didn't do what they were supposed to do and it didn't do me any justice and do me any favors. But that was one of those moments where I knew I had to go do that to get to the next thing because if I didn't, then I wouldn't have did a Christmas special and I didn't wouldn't have led to AJ and the Queen. So all those things, all roads lead, you know, the way you have to do the thing to get to the next thing. So that's what I did. <laughs> well, that's a perfect segue then to my next question was about AJ and the Queen. How oh, did see. that come to be? And where were you when you got the phone call? Was it just a random? What was the mean phone call? They're like, can you step outside for a second? <laughs> we were filming. <laughs> right. Gag. Okay, so we had just finished All Stars. Okay, I had got eliminated the second time. And so I was like, okay, now can I go home? <laughs> They're like, no. Um, what's happening is, um, <laughs> well, yeah, bitch, we're doing a Christmas special. I was like, well, I don't have any Christmas clothes here. I don't have anything. No worries. We already spoke to Christopher. There's a box. He's shipping a box of all your Christmas stuff. And it's on the way. I was like, oh. And then I was looking at the little thing, and they're like, you need an 80s costume, this and that. I'm like, well, I don't have anything. They're like, we already talked to your designer. He already has something that's going to be sending, on a, sending it over. I was, okay, well, y'all just tell me what to do then, because y'all got this all planned out, bitch, because I had no clue. So then we went into filming for the Christmas special. Day two, um, I get pulled out again, and I was asked, um, well, what are you doing the month of September? I was like, I'm getting married. <laughs> and they're like, well, what about like, just like for like maybe two, three weeks? I was like, I'm getting married. I like, all y'all heard me talk about on All Stars is that I'm getting married. This is happening like right now. And so they're like, well, Rue is doing the show, AJ and the Queen, and he really wants you to be in the writer's room because um, anytime you're telling your stories, he just wants to hear more. And so... You have a lot of experience, so we can really use some of your stories in the writer's room. So, of course, I was like, well, let me talk to Christopher, because Christopher had been planning everything by himself and no communication. But luckily, he was there and able to assist me for the Christmas special. That's the only reason why we were able to talk. And so, of course, you can't say no to this opportunity. You know, this is like Warner Brothers, Michael Patrick King, RuPaul, like big names. And I was like... So we talked it over and we're like, well, we gotta make it work. And we we did. And so um, we wound up um, living in LA for three weeks uh, while still planning a wedding from LA that's gonna be in Atlanta. And um, yeah, I was in the writer's room and just sharing my stories and experiences and they wove it all in. And some of the funniest shit that made it in was I talked about um, <laughs> warming up a pork chop on an iron um, at a hotel. <laughs> and he wound up, one of the characters wound up eating the chicken, warming up, cooking his chicken 
<laughs> on iron. So like funny stories made it in and um, it was the best experience. I was so intimidated, but it was so new and so fresh and I felt right at home and where I needed to be. So I definitely want to do more scripted work for sure. Speaking of new things, and you were just talking about getting married, how has married life been, what, a year into it? Oh, we're going to be two years next month. Uh, so, yeah, it's been wonderful, but, like, then this happened, and <laughs> you start, like, having to get reunited and reacquainted, and, you know, it's a whole new relationship because we have never been together this long ever. And so um, things that we're usually uh, dealing with on our own, you're having to face in front of your partner. So sometimes that's not always pretty, but we've gotten stronger and our bond's gotten stronger. And um, I'm grateful to have him because, oh my God, I could not imagine being alone um, going through this. So I'm just really happy. <laughs> when when it comes down to your relationship and that, you know, he helps manage you and the stuff like that, does that ever, do you ever, ever get into like fighting matches or anything like that? Is it difficult to work with your significant other? Well, there's always challenges when you're working with your significant other. And it's about balance and trying to make sure that you maintain um, a professional boundary that doesn't um, cross over into your personal life. And that's the biggest, biggest challenge. And you don't want to carry anything um, work-wise into your relationship that make you fight. So, um, sure, you get into disagreements or misunderstandings about things, and that things don't always go perfectly. But I always try to keep a um, loving, professional tone whenever I address Christopher. I don't ever get out of pocket uh, with him or anybody that I work with, for that matter. So... Ah, I love that. It's like such. It's like a really good thing to hear that you can like kind of be good at all times and just like read situations and stuff. You have to. You have to be able to read the room. You have to be able to read people. You have to all, um, be empathetic to to people's situation. And 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 shit happens. And I'm very forgiving and very patient uh, up until I'm not. And then you know that means that it has worn out and we should be past this situation already. So my patience is gone, boo-boo. And <laughs> then you're going to see the other side, and it ain't pretty. So I try to keep her in play. <laughs> now, many queens have said that they knew of you and admired you and have said that over the course of many seasons of Drag Race, and especially they you know, said it in All Stars 4. Who are queens that you did or do look up to? Well, the queens that I like look up to are mostly the, my local queens and a drag family from down here in Florida that I grew up, that Latrice grew up knowing and aspiring to be like. Um, my Who I refer to as my drag mother is Tiffany Ariakis. And she is, she has been in the business for ever. I think she went to Florida back in 1978. Um, and so um, she's had a long career. And so I've learned all of my business savvy and um, etiquette from her, how to keep a professional relationship, how to, uh, you can work with the devil without going to hell kind of situations because everyone is not going to be on the up and up, but you still have your bills and your life to live. So as long as you don't get your hands dirty, you can still do what you need to do and, and get out clean. And so I learned a lot of uh, how to how, how to do business from her. Um, and Electra, Nikki Adams, these are all legends down here. Um, and pageant queens at that. Yeah. So that's who I really get my backbone from. And Tina Turner, and Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, Dim Queens. Yeah. That's, yeah. Like, I was, when I, I knew Chad Michaels when he came. I knew who he was. And I was very like, oh, Chad Michaels, oh my God. Because that's the most polished bitch in the cut. I don't care where, when you see him. He is 
perfection, always perfection. And so um, I was like, how can someone be that meticulous about their drag? And he is so meticulous and is so perfect and so um, intentional. Everything is intentional and thought out. And I just love seeing it all. So I was I was a fan of Chad's when when he walked in when I walked in. Well, speaking of your Drag Race sisters, one thing that you have said quite a bit is that you do like getting high with some queens. Is there a favorite <laughs> queen that you like to smoke with? Oh, Jasmine, oh, honey, baby, oh, honey, without a question. Oh, honey, my judge, honey, that's. That's what that's the get down, get down. Like when I used to go to her house, honey, you know how to have a key to her house. So um when I used to come down, I would just um let myself in to her place, honey. I she would be if she'd be there or not be there, honey, but there we'd be but lunch rolled and ready on the table when I got there, honey. Trust and believe that. Um but yeah, and when I'm on the road, I love well, everyone loves smoking with me because I get you to a place that you've never gone before. Trust and believe. <laughs> um, when you, if you, if you have a moment and you smoke with Latrice, you're gonna go to a place you have never gone before and uh, be on another level of high. <laughs> um, but I, I, Jasmine's my favorite. Jasmine the Chevelle, honey, with Kiki, for sure. Um, so before we get into the last few questions with you, I have a fun question and then I want to get into one serious topic. <clears throat> one popular question on Reddit that gets asked to all the queens when they do ask me anything is the following. Would you rather fight 10 Kenya Michael size Latrice Royales or one Latrice Royale size Kenya Michaels? Whoa. 10 Kenya size Latrice Royales or one Latrice. Bitch, how is either one of those good? Uh, <laughs> like, I ain't tussling with neither one of them bitches. No, uh, I would rather deal with the one because I could probably. Am I still my size or am I Kenya size? Okay, yeah, I can deal with a Latrice size Kenya. Ooh, that bitch is, yeah, she just gonna just roll her down the street because she gonna be, she that short, she gonna be fat and round and poly. So yeah, probably can't walk really when you think about it. <laughs> that bitch gonna be huffing and puffing and out of breath, honey. She can, yeah, come on here, yeah. A fat Kenya, that'd be funny. <laughs> Now, totally different note. Uh, this year has been a really crazy year. We've had the corona, we've had everything else, and we've had two drag queen legends pass away in the past month, both Lady Red and then just yesterday with Chi Chi. What do you think and what goes through your head when you lose friends or lose people that are so near and dear to you? How are you dealing with that situation and those situations? Well, like anything with loss, it's really, it makes you sad. It just makes you sad and you you, you feel helpless. And um, in both cases where uh, these were people who I was close to, um, it, it, it strikes the nerve and you're just like, when is enough enough? And this year has taken so much. And I've already said, I just said this year has taken so much more than it's given to us. And I, I know that we're going to be changed forever having gone through this. Um, but it's starting to get harder and harder for me to see the horizon. And I'm always the optimist and I'm always the like, the sun is going to come out and we're going to be fine. But it just gets to a point where it's like, how much more can one take? Like, it's, it's just devastating. And luckily, I've, I've been conditioned and taught um, about death and passing early on as a child. And my mother was very spiritual and she definitely... Uh, believed in the spirit world and 
um, kind of taught me and introduced to me uh, introduced me to the afterlife and that the that the spirit does live on and that um, I really am a firm believer. And so, anytime someone passes, you know, they always say that we get it wrong. We're supposed to cry when someone is born into this world and rejoice when they leave it. And that's really the honest to God's truth because being born into this world is not like what you would wish on people right now. This is not the time that you want to be in. Look at us. Look at us. We have, we, this, the world is not a kind place. We're all in a pandemic. They don't want to sit their asses down. They don't want to wear a mask. They want to ex- exercise their right, their privilege, whatever the case may be. And um, it, it makes, makes you go crazy and ballistic inside. So I'm just grateful that um, I hold on to some of the family values and traits that my mother taught me early on about um, the spirit world. So I feel actually relief when I know that they're not suffering and not struggling and and they're at peace. And that gives me peace, you know? Um, the, the grieving process, we all do it differently, but it is for our own selfish reasons. It's because we're going to miss them. And it's okay to feel that. But in all actuality, I'm relieved that they are not suffering and that they're not going through pain anymore here on this earth. So that's where I'm at. It's, I think that that's a really strong trait for you to say that you've kind of come to that realization. Cause I think that it takes a lot to be able to say that. And I think too, it's like, especially in this time and everything that's going on, like dealing with loss and dealing with grief is like two things that can destroy somebody. And you have to be able to find the, the balance and the ability to be like, like you said, the spirituality and like the rejoicing, like, you know, they had a life and it's very good that, you know, that they don't have to deal with the pain anymore and the, all of that stuff. And that's, I mean, it's a good way to actually look at it. I mean, it's the only thing that gets me through it. You know, it's like, it's so unfair. I mean, she, she was so, so young. Um, and this very rare, uh, condition, you know, took her and it took her quickly. Um, she, you know, she only been diagnosed for diagnosed for like three years or so, three, yeah, about three years. And so it's it, it, it the decline was rapid. And uh, but she fought and she never gave up hope that uh, you know she was going to be Chi Chi Devane through it all. And uh, she did that, and her legacy is here. So. Uh, that's what I, I tell and impress upon people is that, you know, it's like, make sure that you are leaving your footprints in the sand, man. Like just like the fact that you were here and made a difference and made a mark on this world. And Chi Chi Devane definitely did that. Xavier did that. He made his mark on this world and we are all heartbroken to have him not with us, but I know that he's with us, you know what I'm saying? And that makes me smile. So, yeah, you can't keep good by you, Queen Down. Trust and believe she's going to be right here cutting up, kicking, and making sure that we're getting it together. So, yeah. Well, speaking about what makes you smile, what is the happiest thing about drag for you? What makes you the happiest about doing it? Oh my goodness. I, you know, it's being able to just to touch people, uh, and give them hope. Any, any time someone, uh, is feeling in that place of hopelessness and helplessness. And if they can turn on YouTube or pick up their phone and look at a video of me or whatever the case is, and, feel better about them, their lives and feel like they can conquer anything. They're like, well, what will Latrice do? Or will Latrice got through prison or whatever it is, it gives them motivation and hope. And, and that's all that I could ever, ever, ever wish for is uh, to touch somebody in a positive way like that. What do you think the biggest misconception of Latrice is? 
<laughs> Y'all see All Stars 4? That was all a big misconception. Trust and believe. That's not who I am, bitches. Y'all know who I am. I tell it like it is. I will cuss you out, cook you dinner, and give you a hug. But <laughs> that's, it's just who I am. Um, but I'm real. And I um, there's nothing that has wavered from... Um, my first appearance on Drag Race to now, all the values that I've held on and hold on to, I still hold on to now. And am I large and in charge and the fiercest big black bitch in the cut? I sure am. And I still say that now. I said it then. I say it now. Not cocky. Just that that's my confidence level. And that's who Latrice is to me. Okay. So if she's not that to you, that's fine. But to me, in my mind, huh. <laughs> <laughs> so what is next for Latrice? I know that you have a podcast, which I'd love for you to talk about. And then tell me what else we can expect from you. Well, I'm so grateful to be um, doing the chop with Manila. And that's on the mom uh, network, moguls of media with, um, Forever Dog and Willem and Alaska, who has uh, graciously expanded their franchise and created a network and invited us to be a part of it. And we're the first queens on it. And I'm just really, really, really thrilled. That gives me lots of joy. Um, and we're just really just trying to cre stay creative and create content from home. I do some digital shows here and there. I'm going to be doing some bingos all this coming up week. You know, fun stuff. And I love that because it's just mindless fun. Play some games, talk some shit, drink some wine. That's what we need to do to get through this. And eat some good food. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. And I'm not traveling. So don't look for me to be on no plane no time soon. Boo-boo. I'm not coming to a city near you or you. Uh... <laughs> I would be right here at the house. So um, so other than that, like not really a lot is going on, but I do have some digital shows that I'll be doing in the future. Um, I want to do um, a Pride South Florida review show, which is the pageant that I own and host that my court is reigning for another year now because we had to postpone. So um, I'm going to be doing that too. And, you know, just some feel good. I'm going to finish my butterfly collection that I've been painting so I can sell it. Um, I'm one painting away from that. And that's that. <sighs> Thinking about all of the drag queens, if you could for one day put on another drag queen shoes, past uh, or present, who would uh, you choose? Um, even though those shoes don't fit me, I will squeeze, I will squeeze into Bianca Del Rio's shoes. I will bust out her shoes in the seams. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Anytime I, I want inside of that brain, just for just a smidgen, I don't want to live there, but I definitely want to go visit, take notes. <laughs> and then punch it, honey. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question for you, Latrice, is what is a message of positivity or um, words of wisdom for the LGBT community? No, I really want everyone to really focus on trying to be a lot more empathetic um, as we are trying to navigate through this um, racist, crazy, pandemic-filled, virus-filled, corrupted, uh, world that we're in and and empathy goes a long way and compassion goes a long way and if we can put those two things together I mean they're right there with love and so if we can like just do that we're gonna be fine you know be a little bit more patient with people uh, but not people who don't wear masks let the let their asses have it because this is why I don't want to hear your excuses. But love, empathy, compassion, do that, and we're gonna be great. We're gonna we're, we're gonna get through this. Oh, I love it! Thank you so much, Latrice, for spending some time with me and being exposed. Absolutely. 
Where can people find you on the socials? Everywhere. Um, if you get me on Twitter, Instagram, I'm at Latrice Royale. On Facebook, I'm Latrice Royale Inc. Um, I'm on Snapchat, but not for real. I only go there to use the filter. <laughs> Use the filter so you can post it on Instagram. So, yeah, that's what you do. And hit a bitch up. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Be sure to comment what your favorite part of the interview was. Uh, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Until next time, I'm Joseph Shepard, and that's the beautiful, wonderful Latrice Royale. Thank, thank you, you, darling. <laughs> <laughs>